in these scriptures, John the Baptist, the forerunner of Christ, is paving the way for Jesus to start his ministry. He is saying, I am baptizing with water unto repentance. But there is one coming after me. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now the word shall, everybody say shall. shall. Now the word shall is used to express what is inevitable or what is going to happen in the future. Shall. Shall is used to express something that is bound to happen. So John actually starts prophesying, Brother Todd, about who is going to come and about the comforter that he is going to leave the world when he's gone. The day that 120 people gathered in an upper room and the Holy Ghost was poured out, the very Spirit of God rushed in like a rushing mighty wind and set upon each of them. And everybody that received it, I mean, caught on fire. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. This is probably going to go back and be some old time preaching this morning. But how many of you know sometimes we need some old time preaching? Come on, somebody. We don't need, listen, there's too much fluff in the pulpit now. There's too much cotton candy in the pulpit now. Sometimes we just need some old time preaching. I want you to know that there's a lot of people out there today that believes the Holy Ghost is nothing more than a tongue talking experience. They talk in tongues more than anybody and all of a sudden they're more holy than everybody is. And there's those people who talked in tongues 20, 30, 40 years ago. They got it all. Now they can just sit back and take it easy and they're ready to fly away. Don't work like that. I'm going to tell you something, folks. We haven't always got it right over the years. We got people prayed through they got baptized in Jesus' name. We prayed them through to the Holy Ghost. And then they were given a set of man-made rules that were nearly impossible for anybody to follow. Right. Most of them you can't even find Bible for. Right. Women were told, oh, you better wear a dress or you're going to hell. Right. Yeah. Men weren't really told much of anything because they were the ones making the rules. That's true. Yeah. Amen, Pastor. That's true. Yeah. That's right. Adultery, fornication, lying, gossiping, backbiting. You don't hear a lot of that preached in the pulpit anymore, but I can find more Bible for those things than I can find for how a person's going to dress. That's right. That's true. Amen. I wish I had a hand clap this morning, but that's all right. I'll preach anyway. Amen. And look, I believe in holiness, and I'll tell you what's happened in the Pentecostal church, folks. As long as people look the part, as long as they look the part, they're okay. But see, people look the part and they get left alone and they are uneducated on the fact that there has to be a relationship with God that is cultivated with prayer, that is cultivated with fasting, that is cultivated down on your knees and staying in the Word of God. It's those things that will show you what true holiness really is. And I'll tell you right now, if a person has the real Holy Ghost, you won't have to worry about if they're dressing holy. If they've got it, they'll dress it. The Holy Ghost will change the very nature of who you are if you will submit your life to it. Amen. Let me tell you something, church. If you've really got the Holy Ghost, you'll bear fruit. That's right. It's, it's, you'll bear fruit. Galatians 5, 22, 23. Paul said, but the fruit of the Spirit. Now wait a minute. He didn't say a spirit. There's a lot of spirits. Ain't but one spirit, and that's the Holy Ghost. That's him. Come on. When you see a capital S, it's talking about the Holy Ghost. It's talking about the Spirit of God. So Paul says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Paul never said the fruit of the Spirit is tongues. 
Oh, that's God. That would mess up a whole lot of Pentecostal people. I wouldn't get to preach in a lot of churches for saying that, but that's all right. Look here. We know that the Spirit of God, in, in the Holy Ghost, is the Spirit of God that lives inside of us. But here's what you need to understand. And it's not talked about near enough. The characteristics of the Spirit will produce fruit. Yes. Let, let me slow down for a second. Amen. When a person's filled with the Holy Ghost, that first initial infilling plants a seed. Where does fruit come from? It comes from a seed. Yes. Okay? If that seed is left unattended, it won't produce anything. It won't. It won't. But when that seed is taken care of, you can see the results of that seed and fruit will show up. So if somebody's got the Holy Ghost, there is going to be fruit coming out of their life. Their character will change. Their very nature will change. Their nature will become the same as the nature of God. So you want to know if a person's really got the Holy Ghost? Look at their character. Are they angry all the time? Come on. Do they show, show love toward everybody? Are they full of pride or are they humble? Are they a peaceful person or are they a troublemaker? Do they have faith or do they not have faith? See, these are all things that we don't think about. But the Bible says we are known by our fruit. Luke 6 and 44. For every tree is known by his own fruit. Here's what it means. If you have the Spirit, it will show in the fruit you bear. If you're not bearing those fruits, then you better check your Holy Ghost. I said, if you're not bearing those fruits, you better check your Holy Ghost. Let me say this. The most powerful evidence of the Holy Ghost is a holy life. That's right. That's right. That's right. Amen. Am I still in a Pentecostal church? Yeah. I'm preaching about the Holy Ghost this morning. We're supposed to be Holy Ghost people. Amen. Yeah. If you ain't living a holy life, you ain't got the Holy Ghost. I don't care how much you talk in tongues. <laughs> this is all I'm gonna, this is all I'm gonna say about the tongues, okay? Some of you know that I'm a shoe collector. I collect shoes. Okay? Now I've calmed down on it. Because I had to. She said I did. <laughs> But I want you to understand something about every pair of shoes I ever bought. The tongues came with them. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's oh. right. That's true. You got the Holy Ghost, tongues will come with it. Yeah. Amen. Amen. The Lord told his people in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 26, verse 37. He said, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you shall keep my judgments and do them. Okay, let's look at the second part of what John said. See, y'all think I'm going to preach till after 12 o'clock. That's my good enough. Okay. <laughs> second part of that. Whose fan is in his hand. And he will thoroughly purge his floor. And will gather the wheat into his garden. But the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. Now, now hold on just a second. There is a second wind that's going to come one day. And it's the wind of judgment. I'm not talking about the wind of the Holy Ghost. Now, let me tell you something about God, folks. God never gave us a book of suggestions. He gave us a book of commandments. We are soldiers in the army of the Lord. I said we are soldiers in the army of the Lord. I want you to understand something. This is a military that you're in. It's not a democracy. In the military, they don't have suggestion boxes. They don't ask you if you want to get up at four in the morning. You hear me? They don't ask you whether you want to eat at five today. Would you like to get out and go for a run today? No, they don't. They tell you what to do and you do it. Right. Yep. <laughs> mm. yep. 
See, we have been bought with a price. We are not our own. We do what he tells us to do or we are wrong. It's that simple. We go by the word of God or we are wrong. And a lot of the church today is of the belief that they can manipulate God somehow. In some way they can get around certain things, Brian, that are in there. Come on. Some scriptures apply to them and some of them don't. But there's coming a time where God's going to get that fan out. And the Bible said that he's going to purge his floor. He's going to thoroughly purge his floor. He ain't going to just purge it. He's going to make sure that it's clean. He's going to make sure that everything is swept and garnished. He is going to take everything out that is not like him. Well, what is his floor? I'm glad you asked. The Lord said, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. His floor is all the earth. All the earth. But that place of judgment that God is going to start with is going to be in his house. He is going to start judgment with his church. 1 Peter 4 and 17. For the time has come that judgment must begin in the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? He's going to start with the ones that's claiming to be some. He's going to start with the ones that said, Lord, have we not cast out devils in your name? Lord, I love you. Oh, I love you, Jesus. I go to church once a week. He's going to start with those. You hear me? You better listen to me this morning. We prophesied in your name. We cast out devils in your name. And he said, look, look here. He's not only, he's not only going to start with the church, but when he gets done with the church, he's going to start with the nations. You better listen to what I'm saying this morning because you can turn on the news and you can see the Bible unfolding in front of your very eyes. Listen, judgment is coming to the United States of America. You can say you heard it here this morning. I said judgment is coming to the United States of America. There is no way that it can't happen. We have got so far from God that it's pathetic. We have got so far from what God wants in this nation that it's America as a whole has turned its back on God. Yeah. And God is not going to stand for that forever. When it comes right down to it, folks, there's two groups of people. There's good people and there's bad people. Well, let's simplify everything. There's good people, there's bad people. There's saints and there's sinners. There's righteous and they're unrighteous. Listen, it's pretty easy to tell who the world is sometimes. But there's a lot of people who are masquerading around as saints that are not what they say they are. That's true. Yeah. You say, oh, preacher, that's judging. No, I'm going to tell you something. I can see fruits. Yeah. I can see fruits. Yeah. Why do you think that Jesus warned the disciples about false prophets as many times as he did? In the book of Matthew 24, I believe it's either four or six times. I'll have to go back and read it. He warned, he kept on, he kept on. Beware of false prophets. Beware of those who's going to lie to you. Beware. They said, Lord, what's going to happen in the end? He said, the first thing you need to understand is there's going to be a lot of people and they're not going to be telling the truth. They're going to come saying they're me. They're going to come preaching in my name. And what they're saying is not going to be true. Listen, folks, if you do not have the Holy Ghost, you will not be able to discern what is a truth and what is a lie. There's a lot of performers in the pulpit out there right now. A lot of showmen out there right now. Just like actors on the stage. You hear me? You want to know if somebody's real or not? I'll show you the best way to tell if somebody's real. Go to their house and stay a day or two. You'll find out what's going on. 
Talk to their husband. Talk to their wife. Talk to their kids for a little while. You'll find out right quick what's going on. Look at their DVR. Look at what they're watching on TV. Go out there and turn on the radio in the car. See what stations they got saved. Come on, I'll tell you something. You want to find out somebody living a holy life, you start probing in their everyday life what they're doing when nobody else is watching. You'll find out who's holy and who ain't holy. There's a story that Jesus told the disciples in Matthew 13 about a man that sowed some seeds. And while that seed was growing, the enemy came in and sowed tares. Yes. Okay? The servants came to him, I mean, and they said, we got to get rid of these weeds. Yes. we got to get rid of these tares. The man said, no, sir, Reed, we're not going to get rid of those tares. Because if you start pulling those things out now before the harvest happens, you're going to mess up the good stuff. You're going to pull out the fruit. You're going to pull out the fruit. Good fruit. You're going to pull out the wheat. So you got to let them things grow up together. And God is going to let the tares and the wheat grow together. And when the harvest comes, he's going to deal with it, honey. He's letting the wheat and the tares grow together right now. But one day he's going to say it's harvest time. I'm going to separate the two. I'm going to separate the sheep from the goats. Let me tell you something. That's what the Bible says. The Bible talks about separating the sheep from the goats. Do you know what? You can't put goats in with sheep. You can't do it. Goats don't need the same nutrition as sheep do. You, you put a goat, you put a goat in with a bunch of sheep, and that, that that goat, he'll end up making it where the sheep don't get a thing. He will root the sheep plum out. He'll eat everything inside. And the sheep will end up not getting anything they need because the goat will eat it all up. And we got a bunch of goats. That are taking nourishment from the sheep. Yep. Amen. Yep. Well, I'll, I'll just go ahead and say it. That's good preaching. It is. That's right. I'm going to tell you something. I listened to a preacher this week. I listened to a preacher this week. His name was B.H. Clendenin. He's an old preacher. Anybody ever heard B.H. Clendenin? Old, old preacher. I mean, old preacher. He was started back in 1950 something and preached all the way through the 70s, 80s. Maybe even the early part of the 90s. I listened to a message, Brother Todd, while I was on the lawnmower yesterday. Old B.H. Clendenin was preaching. It was 1982. I got about halfway through that and I thought, Lord God, if he was preaching today, people would run him out. He'd never get to preach no word. You preach hard today, buddy, they're ready to get rid of you. They don't want that kind of preaching no more. But I'm going to tell you right now, he was preaching in the middle of New York City, right in the Bronx. And I mean, honey, he was shucking the corn. He was laying it down. He was telling them there's going to hell if they didn't straighten up. He was, I mean, he was, listen, he was preaching it right. Just like those old preachers back then used to preach it right. I'm telling you right now, listen, there was people clapping. There was people shouting. Listen, you can't, you can't even preach cotton candy and get anybody to praise the Lord no more. Much less preach hard. Yep. That's right. That's true. Amen. Y'all yep. praise the Lord when you go to the games. Y'all yep. holler when you go to the games. We holler when we go everywhere else. We get mad and upset when somebody says something about us, says something to us. But we get in church and we go stone silent. That's true. Yeah. That's right. Right. And maybe you don't remember the message I preached about the cross a couple of weeks ago. Maybe I need to preach it again. You realize what he done for you, you'll want to do everything for him. Amen. 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 Let me tell you something about, about sin. Okay? Let me tell you something about sin. When that fan comes out, God's going to purge that church. And here, let me, God hates sin. And until a person sees sin the way God sees sin, yes. he'll never leave it alone. That's right. true. Yep. Until you see sin the way God sees sin, you're a sin. You'll be always be a sinner. <laughs> you'll never leave sin alone. But the Bible says God hates sin. And Paul said, shun the very appearance of evil. 
The real church will not fit into a world of sin. And we've got churches now that are even promoting sin to attract a bigger crowd. Yeah. True. Come on, somebody. We got gay people and lesbian people preaching in pulpits about a God they don't even know. Yes, we do. And we got organizations that are uh, ordaining them. Yes. That's true. Lord have mercy, they got a bigger voice than the church does. Yeah, it is. That's the truth. Yep. You tell you something about the chaff and the wheat. They look very similar. Even up close, even from a short distance, you can't hardly tell them apart. So that grain has to go through this process where it's broken down on that threshing floor. And somebody then takes a fork. There's two people. Somebody gets to take, and they take this fork, and they begin the process of winnowing. And they begin to... A shove this grain up in the air. Just big forks of it. Just big shovels of it. Up in the air. And then you got this other. They got the fan over there. This other person has the fan. And they're giving it this right here. And the wheat is falling back down to the floor. The part that is good is going to fall back down where it can be used. But the chaff is going to be blown away by the wind. Honey, you better make sure you ain't part of the chaff. You better make sure that you're part of the church. You better make sure that you're a sheep and not a goat. The Bible said what's going to happen to the chaff is it's going to be burned up. Come on, somebody. Let me tell you something. I, I know this is hard preaching, but I, you need to understand. You need to understand. By this time next week, this country could be changed. I said by this time next week, there could be a whole change around the whole world. Listen, I, we, we could be on the brink of World War III right now. The church better wake up. I said the church better wake up. If God's people don't wake up, who's going to wake up? That's right. Yeah. That's right. Oh, you can't touch nobody no more. You can't get to nobody no more. You can, you can, you can, you can say all you want to. You can preach and teach to your blue in the face. And if somebody don't wants to keep sinning, there ain't nothing you can do about it. You gotta have a heart change. God's gotta get a hold of them people. And I'm in this thing for souls. Listen, your soul is on the line. Blood is not gonna be required of my hand. Your soul is at stake. We got people in the church wanting to try to get help from everything except the Word of God. They're falling for all this propaganda. Buy this book; it'll help you with depression. Buy that book; it'll show you it'll show you how to be the best you. Let me tell you something. When it comes right down to it, brothers and sisters, this is the only book I need to be the best me. This is the only book I need to fight depression. This is the only book I need to show me how to have faith. People going to church and they're falling for every trick in the book. There's a separation coming. Which side will the Lord find you on? I said, which side will the Lord find you on? Let me end with this. If you've got the real Holy Ghost, you'll know how to dress. You'll know what to watch. And you'll know what to listen to. You'll know how to treat people. And you will have a fire in your belly that is burning to serve God. Listen, I said you will have a fire in your belly that is burning to serve God. Listen, when you get around the people of God, they will be something inside you that wants to serve God. They will be something inside you that wants to praise God. They will be something inside you that wants to open your mouth and say, Lord, you've been good to me. So let me tell you what I think. I think the church needs a good dose of the Holy Ghost again. Amen. I didn't mean to preach. Listen. The real Holy Ghost to give you a desire to do the word and hear the word. Yeah. It'll lead you, it'll guide you, and it won't let you fall for an imitation. I said it won't let, listen, me, I, one, of, one, one of Crystal's favorite places to eat, y'all ain't gonna believe this, because it wasn't like that years and years went by. I couldn't get her to go to a Chinese place for nothing. 
No, I'm not eating that mess. That's dog. That's cat. That's somebody's cat. That's somebody's German shepherd. I'm not. I'm not eating in one of them places. No, sir, Bob. Uh, uh. No, sir. I'm not eating in one of them places. Listen, I, 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 I try every time. Hey, I, I like them gophers on a stick they got. I guess that's what they're called. I don't know. But I don't know. Within the last year, all of a sudden, she likes Chinese. She just started liking it. I'm like, okay, we don't have to wait. We can go right in and start eating. I like anywhere where you can go right in and start eating. You can't even do that at McDonald's. You got to wait. You can't do that at the steakhouse. You can't do that at the Mexican. Well, you might get some chips, but all them do is make me mad. But there's, there's just stuff that they've got that I really like. I mean, I really like it. I pile my plate up with it. I'll go back two or three times and get it. And it's this crab. But guess what? If, I, if you ate that much crab, it cost you $300. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. It's true. You hear me? If you ate that much crab, real crab, it cost you two or $300 to get that much crab meat. It's imitation. Yeah. It's imitation. It's still good. But it ain't the real thing. It ain't like the real thing, folks. Let me tell you something. Listen, there's a lot of things going on out there that people think are good, but it ain't real. It ain't real. The real thing will cost you more. The real thing will cost you more than a $13.95 buffet. You hear me? The real thing will cost you a lot more. You'll lose friends over it. You hear me? Listen, you're not talking to you're not you're not you're not listening to a virgin voice up here. I've lost friends over it. I said I've lost friends over it. I've lost people who used to call me on a daily basis basis that won't have nothing to do with me no more. Come on, somebody. Let me tell you, the anointing will cost you. The Holy Ghost will cost you. We got to have it. I said we got to have it. And let me tell you this. Our children have got to have it. Listen, the most important thing that we can ever do for our kids is to urge them to get the Holy Ghost and get on fire for God. Thank you. That's it. That's the most important thing we can do for our children is to get them in the altar and get them filled with the Holy Ghost. When Jesus makes his return, I've got a feeling that the church ain't going to look like what a lot of people thinks it looks like. I'm serious. If you got it and it's real, you'll want what God wants. You, because that's his spirit living inside you. If you got the real thing, you're going to want what he wants. He ain't going to dwell in an unclean temple. He, you're, 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 what you want is going to line up with what he wants. And if what you want don't line up with what he wants, you better go check your Holy Ghost. You better get back. You better get back and get that seed planted again. Come on, somebody, and play. I'm almost done. Listen, I can't come in here and just play church. There's souls at stake. That's right. There's souls at stake. I can't do that, folks. I can't play church. We can't afford to do that anymore. We can't afford to come in here and then just live. Like we've got another 20 or 30 or 40 years left. We can't. Uh, last, was, it, was it this past Monday that the eclipse happened? Was that this past Monday? Okay. Yeah, we were out there like a bunch of silly things with our glasses on at work. Look it up. And I thought, Lord, have mercy. How many people ever go outside and look up waiting? Not for an eclipse, but for him. <laughs> Lord, could this be the day? How many people go outside and look up and say, Lord, could this be the day? We don't. And there was a lot of people that said, well, well, then, you know, the Lord's going to come back. He may come back April 8th when they have this eclipse. Well, let me tell you something. In the United States of America alone, there's between seven and and 8,000 people that die every day. The Lord did come back for somebody right now. He 
came back for somebody Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. He's coming back for people today. You ain't promised you got it. You ain't promised you're going to live another 10 years. You ain't promised you're going to live tomorrow. You ain't promised nothing. There's a wind about to blow, and I am determined not to be part of that chaff. I don't want to be part of that chaff. What about you? Would you raise your hand today? I'm going to leave you with this one very direct and powerful scripture. It is one of the most direct, in your face scriptures in the whole entire Word of God. Sometimes I look right over it because there's another kind of famous scripture that's right after it. And we look past this one, Buster. But it's Romans chapter 8 and verse 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, capital S. If so be that the Spirit of God, capital, that's the Holy Ghost. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. 